evening. Thank you for joining us. I'm Jennifer Lezak, Coordinator of Special Projects with the Adult Services Department. And on behalf of everyone at the Chicago Public Library, welcome. This event is part of the 2021 One Book One Chicago season, exploring the theme Neighborhoods, Our City's Bedrock, and the book Bedrock Faith by Eric Charles May. Please visit onebookonechicago.org for other upcoming programs, reading recommendations, on-demand video content, and more coming now through the end of the year. This program is possible and One Book One Chicago is generously funded by donations to the Chicago Public Library Foundation. Visit cplfoundation.org for information on how you can get involved with their work. During tonight's program, we encourage you to leave your questions in the chat for our Q&A following the program. Now I'm so excited to welcome tonight's program featuring author David Sadowski. Chicago's system of elevated railways, known locally as the L, has run continuously since 1892 and, like the city, has never stood still. It helped neighborhoods grow, brought their increasingly diverse populations together, and gave the famous loop its name. But today's system has, radi has changed radically over the years. The L is more than just a way of getting around. Its trains are a place where people meet and interact. Some say the best way to experience the city is via the L with its second story view. Author David Sadowski grew up riding the L all over the city. He's the author of Chicago Trolleys and Building Chicago Subways and runs the online Trolley Dodger blog. His latest book, Chicago's Lost Ls, is virtually a secret history of Chicago. And this is your ticket. Please join me in welcoming author David Sadowski. David, so pleased to have you here. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Yes, um, I uh, will uh, pro start my program now and uh, we'll look at a bunch of uh, pictures and, uh, and uh, hopefully you will uh, enjoy it and uh, we'll do the questions and answers at the end. So we'll get started. Uh, this is one of a trifecta of books that I've done about Chicago and its uh, transit history and who knows, uh, maybe in the future there will be more. Uh, this is a gate car, an elevated gate car, as you can see this uh, conductor is uh, opening and closing uh, the gates so you can let people on the train. On uh, some of the metal L cars up till the early 1950s, the conductor had to ride between the, the cars uh, to open the doors in any weather. The L got started um, for the Columbian Exposition. And actually there was an electric railway, it was an experimental one, Columbian Intramural Railway at the fair. Uh, this uh, is a map in my book. It shows uh, when all the different branches of the L were started up to the time of the Chicago Transit uh, Authority took takeover in 1947. By 1917, the L had uh, been around for 25 years and reached most of its uh, extents, extent here. This is the map of the south side L, the first elevated, which has uh, a main line and some branch lines. It, uh, it, it went to various places, we'll discuss those. It, here it is under construction in 1890. This is around 35th Street. It copied L's that were in New York City, used steam at first on uh, this line and the Lake Street L. Electricity came later, that was a new thing. So the 35th Street Station, as it originally looked on the South Side L, also known by some people as the Alley L. It had uh, eventually three tracks for most of the way, an express track and going in one direction in rush hour and then two local tracks. This is near 18th Street. Uh, this is uh, Bronzeville near 39th Street, 1941. Uh, 40th in Indiana, an important uh, changeover point between the Kenwood lines, the Stockyards lines, uh, and trains heading further south. Uh, a lot of uh, three-car trains on the L back then. It had a three-man crew, and it was, uh, unfortunately, all men. Uh, it's the 58th Street Station with uh, its original building. There's only one building of that kind left and it's at 55th. It's not in use anymore, but uh, it still exists. This is how it looked in 2013. Uh, this is the uh, L crossing uh, Garfield uh, Boulevard, 55th. Uh, this is the Harvard station on the Englewood branch, uh, probably right after it opened around 1908. 
Uh, this is uh, the El Passing over Little Englewood Station. You can see the Southtown Theater at left. And this is the Halstead Street Station, probably again right after it opened around 1908 on the Englewood Branch. Uh, you could catch other trains here or uh, buses for points further south than 63rd Street. This is the Jackson Park Branch going over the Illinois Central before the IC was electrified. That is now the Metro Electric down below. And the line was at Stony Island at Jackson Park. And originally it went further east into the uh, grounds of the World's Columbian Exposition. This is a uh, stockyards train, again, a gate car. If you wondered why there isn't a stockyards branch anymore, this is the reason because we don't, re we have this thing called refrigeration and you don't need to have a stockyards anymore. So along with the stockyards vanishing, so did the train. There was a fire in 1934, said to be the worst since the great Chicago fire in 1871, but they rebuilt the uh, L. Uh, the building at, at uh, straight ahead is a bank building. Uh, that's about the only thing in this picture that still exists. Some more pictures of the stockyards L which had a loop, a uh, single track loop, which went around, uh, here's a single track loop, which went around some of the uh, places there like Swift and Packers, the meat, the meat packing uh, companies. It was never uh, really very highly utilized line. It was always run as a shuttle. The only time it any, had any ridership was when they had uh, conventions at the International Amphitheater. This is a year after the Stockyards branch closed in 1957, the remnants of uh, one of the stations. The Kenwood branch also branched off from 40th and in Indiana heading east. Uh, it was uh, built on an embankment mostly. It was uh, owned by a different company, the Chicago Junction Railway, and it was leased to the Rapid Transit. This is uh, one of what uh, one of the stations looked like. Most of them looked like this, kind of Spartan. Uh, near the lake, the Kenwood branch uh, headed south. Then uh, ran over some uh, L structure, metal structure for a short period of time before it reached the end of the line at 42nd and Oakenwald. There's a bunch of coal being stored underneath the L. You'd think that would be a fire hazard. This is the end of the line at 42nd and Oakenwald. The uh, small yard that they had there probably right after it opened in the early 1900s. I uh, made the acquaintance of a man uh, in this picture, the toddler in this 1945 picture, Ross Serrano, Japanese American, who uh, was born in an internment camp and then his family for many years lived right uh, at the end of the line there at the Kenwood L. This is inside one of the Kenwood trains in the 1950s, these wooden L cars. Um, when the CTA came into being, they took over this line They uh, and all the others, they made this into just a shuttle operation. It only went as far as 40, 40th in Indiana. Then there also was another shuttle operation, a small line going to Normal Park, branching off of the Englewood L. Started out here at 63rd and Harvard and just ran to 69th Street, only three quarters of a mile. So this is the shortest L branch of them all. This is as far south as the L went until the Dan Ryan line opened in 1969. Uh, the Lake Street L started with steam just as the south side L did. Here it is under construction in 1892. Going over the Chicago River with a swing bridge under steam. The 
the uh, distinctive Queen Anne style architecture some of the stations still have. I believe that's Ashland. There was a uh, transfer station with the Metropolitan L uh, around Polina starting in 1913. Again, uh, the distinctive Queen Anne style architecture on the Lake Street L. At uh, Laramie heading west to Oak Park, there was a ramp going down to ground level and the Lake Street L ran on the ground from 1901 until 1962. This is the Ridgeland station in Oak Park. It ran in South Boulevard. Again, this is uh, downtown Oak Park. Uh, this is a very early picture, early 1900s. This is what uh, the same area looked like. This is the Wisconsin Avenue station now uh, called Marion Street in Oak Park. Uh, nearby, the Chicago Northwestern had uh, commuter trains on an embankment. Steam up until about 1956. This is the last day of the ground level operation in October 1962. Before the L was put onto the nearby embankment which was a win-win for everybody concerned. This is about a year or two later. Already they're getting rid of every trace of the L that had been on the ground. And, and now of course, Metro has taken over the commuter trains from uh, the Chicago Northwestern. This is the Union Pacific West line. And now they, the L has a yard out that way. This is how it looks today. Now this uh, map mostly shows the Metropolitan West Side Elevated, which was uh, built electric right from the start, opened in 1895 and had several branches. It was built down the center of blocks instead of next to an alley or in a street. There's some people, early workers on the uh, Met. Another uh, con is a con conductor, probably at Logan Square. At first, the trains terminated downtown inside a building, at, but it was an inadequate situation, very congested. And then the solution uh, came up with uh, then in 1897 was the loop, con combining everything on the loop. It's a connecting track which went from the Met to the loop. Uh, trains crossed the Chicago River over a bridge, which had four tracks. It was actually two bridges side by side. Here, this is just west of the loop at Canal Street, heading over uh, the trains going into Union Station in 1924. Uh, this is just west of there, Garfield Park L, the Metropolitan Main Line. Uh, that huge building in the back is the powerhouse for the Met. You had to make your own power back then. Uh, you couldn't just buy all this electricity commercially. Uh, everything branched off or came together at Marshfield Junction, about 1700 west. Douglas Park on the left, Garfield Park in the middle, Logan Square and Humboldt Park on the right. Here's a train going to the northwest side, Logan Square and Humboldt Park. Uh, Douglas Park L was extended to uh, Berwyn, ran there until uh, starting in the 1920s. Here it is at Oak Park Avenue, the end of the line. Uh, this is the 50th Avenue Station, which was then uh, later moved to the Illinois Railway Museum, and that's the interior of it, how it looks now. Uh, the Garfield Park L had to go to make way for the Congress Expressway, now the Eisenhower Expressway, and here's how that looked in 1953, right after it closed. Uh, for a few years, then the Garfield Park trains ran on the ground in a portion of Van Buren Street with third rail. Here's the Garfield Park station at California Avenue. The station at Pulaski uh, showing a uh, typical Met L architecture, the stairways. 
the Cicero Avenue station. And then west of Cicero, there was a ramp, <laughs> excuse me, going down to ground level the rest of the way out. They had a large yard at Laramie Avenue. Here we're looking east. And then the same thing uh, looking to the west from Laverne. Uh, Laramie Avenue in the 1950s, by this time, the uh, Congress Expressway is open, into, open to Laramie, as far west as Laramie only. So cars are coming and going off that. Here the L is uh, passing uh, the south end of Columbus Park near Central Avenue. This Gunderson Station was uh, built to serve a development there at Gunderson Avenue in Oak Park, running on ground level. This is uh, Oak Park Avenue in 1935, looking north. Some of those buildings are still there. Uh, end of the line at Desplaines Avenue as it looked in the 1950s, with a loop to uh, turn the L trains back around. Uh, crossing Desplaines Avenue around 1953. Same location in 1959 as construction of the Congress Expressway was well underway. Now the Eisenhower I-290. There was a, a branch line running over part of the Aurora and Elgin Interurban, um, branching out over to Bellwood and Westchester ended at Mannheim and 22nd Street. Here's a, a Westchester car branching off from the Chicago Aurora and Elgin main line in Bellwood. One of the stations is the Bellwood station right before it opened. Uh, crossing Madison Street in uh, Bellwood in the 19, early 1950s. This line uh, was shut down in December 1951. Uh, Roosevelt Road Station in the late 1920s as they were extending the line further south to 22nd Street. Uh, here's the connection, new connection between the Douglas Park L and the Congress Expressway at right, and then the old connection heading north on the Polina L at left. For one day then, you had old L's and new L's uh, running at the same time, June 21, 1958. Logan Square uh, and Humboldt Park trains uh, here at uh, North and Damon. And then there's a tower you can see in the background where trains headed to Humboldt Park. This is Logan Square uh, terminal in 1908. Uh, as far west as the train went uh, in the northwest side until 1970. And then here it is in the same station in 1958. The interior of the station. I remember this well. This was my, actually my favorite L station when I was a kid. And uh, they had a, a bookstore there, a newsstand, magazines, paperback books. I love this station. It was, I was sad when they closed it. Um, a control tower, the uh, switches were controlled by these levers, which had, had a lot of strength to pull. It's called an interlocking. There's another, uh, there's a motorman on a Metropolitan L train in the early days. Some more uh, Met L workers, and here they are in the Humboldt Park branch early 1900s. Uh, this is a two car train going to Logan Square and Humboldt Park and they would have uh, separated these two cars at Damon and North Avenue. The Polina L, this is uh, the Madison Street Station right by uh, where United Center is now. Looking to the west, uh, where uh, Chicago Stadium was actually under construction when this picture was taken in the late 1920s. Looking to the east, uh, here's a Madison Street uh, streetcar, 
movie theater is showing a Gene Harlan movie. She had just died in uh, 1937. Here uh, is some construction going on on the Humboldt Park branch. The Humboldt Park uh, crossing. Uh, this is the Humboldt Avenue station in 1949. End of the line, only went to about 3700 West which really wasn't far enough. It didn't really have its own yard either. There were plans to extend it, this never happened. CTA turned it into a shuttle line and uh, you had to walk a long distance to get to the Dame in the North Station. It was rather inconvenient. Here there uh, two trains collided near the end of the line. They uh, were both trying to do the same thing at the same time and just ran into each other. And here's why Humboldt Park uh, didn't last because uh, the CTA built this uh, subway uh, extending to the to downtown from there, and it just didn't fit in with their plans. So here's the con new connection of Douglas Park to Lake Street trains used today by the Pink Line, and then it left is the old connection of the Polina L. And there's a bridge that is uh, from that still left, and it's being used by uh, Metro Trains uh, as a signal bridge. And this is the uh, L station at uh, Damon and North Avenue. And the building in back uh, once told uh, housed the uh, Double Door Rock Club. This is the Northwestern Elevated, which uh, had a branch uh, built uh, called the Ravenswood. Uh, just north of the Chicago River, the old uh, Northwestern Station, which closed in 1911. This is the new station being built on the same site in, around 1930 uh, for the Merchandise Mart, one of the world's largest buildings. The original uh, station entrance at Chicago Avenue dates to the early 1900s. These uh, two cars are the ones that uh, have been saved as the uh, historic cars by the, by the CTA, but here they are in actual service. Uh, this is the Willow Station, which was torn down uh, for construction of the State Street subway ramp, which uh, went here, closed in 1942. Here's a uh, uh, southbound uh, train at Belmont. Uh, baseball today, there was a doubleheader. This is 1968. Uh, the only station on the Ravenswood that was actually closed was the station called Ravenswood. Here, uh, I believe this is uh, Rockwell, ground level portion of the Ravenswood L, today's brown line. The uh, original uh, terminal, end of the line, at Lawrence and Kimball. Again, Lawrence and Kimball, probably around 1949, showing the original station, which has been changed twice since then. The uh, Northwestern Elevated's main line, four track main line heading north. And it, it connected here with a freight line. Again, you can see on the right, it is near Wilson Avenue. You can see the freight line descending down to ground level on the ramp at right. The uh, station at Wilson Avenue, and they opened a ground level portion around 1908. Uh, this is uh, when, when service was uh, started on the ground level portion. Uh, this freight line here, which went by Wrigley Field and headed north, is actually how the Northwestern else extended its service north of Wilson Avenue. They took over a uh, commuter rail line and freight line, which had been their Milwaukee Road on that. This is an old Milwaukee Road commuter station at rear and a freight train that uh, Rapid Transit had. Uh, this is the Wilson Avenue uh, yard, which doesn't exist anymore. Uh, Lower Wilson yard, which also doesn't exist anymore. Uh, uptown, uh, Wilson Avenue, it was a boom town in the 1920s, thanks to the L. 1929. Uh, this is a, a building here designed by Frank Wright 
uh, called the Store Arcade Building, which was uh, here they're showing it being torn down in 1922 because they were going to replace it with this new Uptown Union Station, which uh, has been recently renovated and uh, looks good as new. Here they uh, they took the ground level portion of the train north of there, and they're here they're building the embankment, which now 100 years later is being rebuilt. This is the opening of the station at Lawrence Avenue. Now that it's completely being rebuilt now. Uh, they have the uh, four track main line and a, a freight track heading south here at this point. Uh, this is the an Evanston Express Shoppers Special heading south on this freight track in uh, the 1955. Before they had third rail installed on that track, this is Howard Avenue. To the left, it was the North Shoreline trains. Uh, to the right, the Evanston branch of the L. Uh, Howard Yard under uh, being rebuilt and reconstructed in 1949 once the CTA took over. Uh, map showing the branches going to Skokie and Evanston. Uh, originally, uh, service ended at Central Avenue in Evanston, all at ground level, but eventually it was all put onto an embankment. Here they're building the embankment at left, while the trains continue at, at ground level on right. They, they put up one track at a time. This is a uh, Calvary station, which was only uh, in business uh, for a very short period of time. It closed in 1931, it had no ridership because it went to a cemetery. This is uh, Central Avenue, the first train going over the uh, raised portion of Central Avenue in the late 1920s. Uh, this Central Avenue uh, station and facade under construction. And uh, here's how it looks today in Evanston. There was a station at Isabella at the north end of Evanston, a very lightly used station. It uh, showed up in the credits the, uh, to the Bob Newhart show opening. Uh, here at, at uh, Linden Avenue, this uh, is a North Shoreline track has just been cut off in 1955 because that portion of the North Shore line interurban was abandoned. Here's the opening of the uh, Nile Center branch of the L in uh, 1925. Uh, Nile Center train. This is uh, branch was abandoned in 1948, but now was revived in 1964 as the Skokie Swift, which is now the, today's Yellow Line, one of the stations on the Nile Center branch. It had some very distinctive architecture, another station on the Nile Center branch. All these uh, stations uh, have been removed many years ago. The interior of the Asbury Station in Evanston, as it was when new. This is the end of the line uh, for the uh, this branch in uh, Dempster Street in Skokie, and a pocket track. Uh, this is, uh, I think, East Prairie Road. Uh, had state station had entrances on two sides. Uh, now, the Skokie Swift took over uh, after the North Shoreline quit. The CTA bought five miles of right of way and made the Skokie Swift, which is today's yellow line. The dumpster station has been saved and moved so that you could have a bus turnaround nearby. This is the Oakton uh, station, the original one, which was eventually torn down. And then in the early 2000s, it was replaced by a new station by the CTA, the only one on the Yellow Line branch. A uh, map showing uh, tra tracks downtown and how some of the station platforms were lengthened and, and actually combined. You could walk from one station to another. From 1913 to 1969, the loop was unidirectional. It ran counterclockwise, both tracks. 
There was, uh, and even before that, it was bi-directional, but left-hand running. This is around 1905, looking west along Van Buren from Tower 12, looking north along uh, Wabash from Tower 12, again with the loop running, left-hand running, bi-directional. This is uh, early 1940s uh, Evanson Express heading north on Wabash. Um, this is a, a Met car, but it had a trolley pole installed on it. Uh, very unusual running as a single car in the Douglas Park branch. This is one of the very early Lake Street L cars with uh, dating back to when they were left-hand running. You see the operators on the left. Uh, this train is, is heading northbound actually in 1966 on the, uh, from uh, Wabash going onto Lake. This is on Lake Street, gate car. Uh, again, on Lake Street, this is the old station of Clark and Lake. Tower 18 was the busiest train intersection in the world for many years. As you can see with all these different trains going in different directions. And they, they were, uh, because of congestion, they had to lengthen some platforms and actually combined stations. Uh, so they'd have more places to put the trains. Uh, this is a, a metal uh, car in the rear and a wood car in the front. Something uh, that they were still doing by 1955. Uh, this is, this is the uh, looking north along Wells where there was an old connection to the Met L. This is Tower 8. Uh, straight ahead was the connection to the Met. Eventually that was removed and later on in the early 1960s, here's how it looked, all, everything is gone. The tower, the tracks, all removed. The uh, opening of the State Street subway in 1943 remo uh, removed some trains from the L and, and actually uh, helped it a lot by reducing the congestion. This is the first uh, official train in the State Street subway in 1943. And then the uh, Dearborn subway, which opened in 1951, also uh, reduced uh, congestion and uh, some of the heaviest uh, ridership now is in the subways. Here is the Loop L in 1964 with the Ravenswood train on. It's still running in the counterclockwise direction. And Tower 18 is being dismantled and replaced in 1969 because uh, they needed a different connection there for the new Lake, Lake Dan Ryan line. 1959, this is stationed at uh, State Street, State and Van Buren. Uh, five different kinds of L trains are visible in this picture, showing you how they've changed over the years. Uh, this is a wood car coupled to a, a 4,000 series metal L car. Uh, post -war, first post-war cars from 1947, 1948, more modern, more features, some old wooden L cars in storage at Lockwood Yard. As you can see, vandals have broken some of the windows before these things were scrapped and, uh, and often just simply set on fire. It's something you would not, um, they would not do that today because of the pollution. Uh, riders on a train, a 4,000 series L train in 1970. And uh, here's some riders in 2019 on one of the CTA's historic cars, one of the 6,000 series cars, which have been brought back um, to be part of their heritage fleet. This is the interior of a 2000 series L car, which was the first uh, ones that had air conditioning. After the 6,000 were retired, some of them went to serve uh, in Pennsylvania on the Norristown line. There's a restored gate car. There's only one in existence at the Illinois Railway Museum. It's been brought back to its original appearance in 1898. 
uh, the interurban here, the Chicago Aurora and Elgin here, it crossed Des the Des Plaines River in Forest Park. Uh, here's some Aurora and Elgin cars in Lockwood Yard uh, near Laramie Avenue. Everything west of Laramie was owned by the Aurora and Elgin. The interior of an Aurora and Elgin car right before it was scrapped in 1962. Uh, Warren Elgin uh, cut back their service to, to uh, Forest Park in 1953. They didn't want to be involved with the temporary right away the CTA had. In 1957, they were allowed to stop passenger service. And here is um, a later train, which was an attempt to get things going again, but it didn't work. The line was abandoned. And here it is in 1959. Uh, about a, two years after abandonment, and they had uh, freight service also on that line out in the suburbs, the western suburbs, going to Aurora and Elgin. Here's the very last uh, ever Aurora and Elgin train, which was uh, to pick up all the unused freight cars along the line. It's called a cleanup train. This is in uh, Villa Park, and the station is still there, and uh, now the right of way has been turned into the Illinois Prairie Path. The North Shoreline is the uh, streamlined electroliner at the North Shoreline Station in Milwaukee. Uh, North Shoreline train running on the, on the ground on, right in the street in Kenilworth. Uh, here's a train in, uh, I believe this is uh, Evanston. and in Waukegan. Uh, they had their own uh, ticket agent and station downtown at uh, Adams and Wabash. For the connection there, you could walk into the L. On the shoreline route, it branched off from the Evanston branch and here went down uh, Greenleaf Avenue and Wilmette before heading north. Here's how that same location looks today. There is a Panera where the station used to be. There's a North Shoreline train stopping at one of the uh, L stations in Evanston. They had their own platforms so that could keep people separated. They couldn't just hop onto a CTA train. They had the uh, use of much of the Roosevelt Road station because the CTA wasn't using it after the State Street subway opened. Here is the motor, the motorman taking off the last, uh, the headlight off the last, the very last North Shoreline train in January 21, 1963. After the North Shoreline quit, uh, the two Electroliners went to uh, Pennsylvania and here they are running on the Norristown High Speed Line as part of Red Arrow. There were some stations, um, stub end terminal stations, four of them on the loop elevated. And despite of the fact uh, that, that they were all connected, the most complicated track arrangement was at the Well Street terminal. Each of the four privately owned companies had built their own stub end terminal. Here's a electrified train heading into the old Congress terminal in the late 1890s as, uh, as the South Side L was being electrified, the, the old Congress uh, terminal which was originally the, the, where the Southside L ended up before the Loop L was built. Congress terminal hung around uh, for a while because it was still being used by the North Shoreline to load baggage. So uh, here it is in 1962, they're, they're loading baggage onto a train, which then would head back to Roosevelt Road and then head north on the L, ending up in Milwaukee. Uh, this is the uh, North Waters uh, uh, terminal at left here. You can see the, the walkway branching off from the Merchandise Mart. This is the North uh, Water terminal. Again, another stub end terminal. Eventually they, 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 they had very few trains that uh, terminated there. This is the uh, inaugural trip of the Electroliner in 1941. And uh, they introduced a new paint scheme called the Silver Liner paint scheme in 1950 at the North Water Terminal. 
the CTA also used it to introduce the new 6,000 series cars in 1950. And this is the entrance to the North Water Terminal, which um, was removed in the early 1960s. Doesn't exist anymore. The loop uh, uh, had a branch here going down Market Street, which is now um, now Wacker Drive. This is the lake, where the Lake Street all terminated before they built the rest of the loop. Had two stations on this uh, Market Street branch ending just north of Madison Street by the Civic Opera House. All this had to go when they decided to build Lower Wacker Drive. And there was the Well Street Terminal served by the Met and by the Aurora and Elgin trains. Opened in 1905. That's an Aurora and Elgin train in the early 1920s. This is the original uh, configuration of the Well Street Terminal before they added uh, some more floors to it in the 1920s and, and renovated it. You can see that part of it was like a facade. And then uh, later the CTA uh, made a new L connection through the old Well Street Terminal in 1955 when they had to get rid of the uh, L that had been on uh, uh, the old L connection on Market Street. And here is an Aurora and Elgin train coming out of the Well Street Terminal. Zero on the tower there means that the heat should be set to zero because this is uh, summertime. This is an electrical substation, uh, which dates back to the old uh, Met L, is still there today, even though the L itself is not. And, uh, and here's uh, Shirley Temple taking a ride on the L in 1938. At the height of her popularity, she was uh, 10 years old at the time. There's a letter someone wrote to the Met in 1890. Well, the Met wrote this letter in 1896 trying to collect a debt for advertising that, uh, by a cycle company which had not been paid. Here are some weekly passes from uh, the Rapid Transit Company in the 1920s, 30s. The old L reached a high point in 1926 when hundreds of thousands of people went to the Eucharistic Congress in Mundelein. And then this is uh, the Morgan Street Station with a train decorated with the flag of the city of Chicago, which seems an appropriate uh, thing for our presentation today. Our book uh, is connected to my blog, a Trolley Dodger blog. You can purchase my book through the trolleydodger.com. And if you buy the book from me, I will not only sign it, but you'll get a facsimile map of a 1926 map showing the rapid transit system. And on the back of it, uh, useful facts about the L at that time. And we've reached the end of the line. That is the uh, end of our program. I hope that you have enjoyed it. And, uh, and as I say, the book is available through me and also through Amazon and wherever Arcadia books are sold. Thank you so much, David. That was fantastic. Um, we have a couple of questions from the audience that uh, they wanted to ask you, so we'll go through them. Um, one of them is, can you talk a little bit about some of the reasons why some of the lines were shut? And I realize there may be many reasons. Yes, uh, the, the Humboldt Park branch ran uh, right next to North Avenue and the uh, CTA uh, felt after they had consolidated the surface system in the L, they felt that people would just as well ride uh, trolley buses on North Avenue. And they also didn't want to buy new equipment for such a lightly used line, which didn't really go far enough and it didn't really make any sense to stop where it did. If they could have extended it, that would have been a very, very popular line, but they didn't want to buy new L cars to run on there. And so they, they, they wanted to shut it down and, and uh, it was only operated as a shuttle for a year before they finally did shut it down. Then um, the uh, stockyards faded away and they had uh, a lease, a 50 year lease on the stockyards and Kenwood lines with the company that owned 
and built those lines. And when that lease ran out, um, they didn't, they, they couldn't come to terms. Uh, they didn't, they hadn't been making payments in many years. The rapid transit company stopped paying rent on the Kenwood line in the 1930s. And, and from that point forward, they were hassling each other about who's, who's responsible for paying for this and who's responsible for the upkeep and things like that. So finally, they uh, just completely got rid of that. The normal park line was only three quarters of a mile long and it really didn't go anywhere. Um, so that uh, had to go. Uh, the Nile Center branch was the one that came back um, as the Skokie Swift once the North Shoreline quit and the CTA bought five miles of uh, the right of way. The Garfield Park line was rebuilt as the, as the Congress median line of the rapid transit, the Douglas Park was cut back. Uh, it was lightly used and they had a lot of grade crossings which were all manually operated. They didn't have automatic crossings at, uh, at these uh, streets. Uh, they wanted to install automatic crossings but Berwyn was opposed to it. So there were some people in these early days like the early 1950s who didn't trust automatic gates. They, they, they wanted it to be manually operated. So uh, they couldn't come to terms about that. And therefore the CTA just said, okay, well, we'll just cut it back to 54th Avenue and uh, you can ride the bus on Cermak, which is right there. So there, there were different reasons why um, many of these things were, were cut back. Um, the, the Lake Street L could have been cut back, but it wasn't because they managed to uh, put that Western portion that ran on the ground onto the embankment, which was right next to it, which was very fortunate. And that worked out well for everyone. But these are little, little branch lines, which were feeding into um, the main lines. And then they had some express tracks and local tracks, but, um, the whole idea was kind of outmoded because the CTA wanted to speed up service and just have everything be an express. And that didn't fit in with having all these little branch lines. That makes sense. Um, we got a couple of specific questions, which I don't know if you'll know the answer to, but okay. asks, what about the Kyler shuttle? Was it originally an L line or always just a shuttle? Do you know anything about the Kyler shuttle? Well, um, Yes, that was a branch off of the Lake Street L in the very early days now um, in Oak Park. Um, all of the L's wanted to have branch lines. Um, as it turned out, the, one, the only one who didn't really have a successful branch line was the Lake Street L, but their, their success was simply in extending the service from Laramie where the L ended all the way into uh, Oak Park and Forest Park, which happened in 1901. But there were these other attempts to have uh, the trains going in different places in Oak Park, which basically would were running kind of like as a streetcar operation. And the, as the area began to develop, the local people didn't want that. And they started hassling the rapid transit company uh, about that. and. And in some cases, uh, you had people tearing up the tracks in the middle of the night and, and things like that and, and uh, trying to void fran their franchises and, and, and different things. So the Kyler L was, was a very minor kind of operation and it only lasted for a few years and it wasn't uh, successful in any way, shape or form. And then as the L was then consolidated in the early 1900s, it, um, it just went away. So that, that, was the, that was the Kyler L. That's fascinating. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize people would be tearing up their own tracks. They were so mad about the train. <laughs> they didn't want the trains in there running down their street. Um, in their nice and peaceful neighborhood. Someone else asks, um, my neighborhood Alstop is currently under construction and it has been terrible for the neighborhood, especially the small businesses. What do you think are the biggest impacts of L's, L stations on neighborhoods in Chicago, good or bad? 
Well, um, the L was uh, responsible for much of the growth of the city. If you look at specific neighborhoods, you can see that for a fact. Uh, the uptown neighborhood in particular, uh, it was like a boom town in the 1920s. And it was all because of the access that you had uh, from the L, not only heading south to downtown, but eventually uh, starting 1919, you could take a train there and go all the way to Milwaukee on the North shoreline. So the, the, uh, the benefit was uh, by far outweighed any inconvenience uh, that you, you might've had. And since the tracks are separated from uh, street level, um, you could hardly say that there um, is anything that's inconvenient uh, about it. I mean, construction, yes, you have uh, construction going on probably for a few years in some of these places, but you're rebuilding something which lasted an embankment, for example, which lasted for 100 years. And if they rebuild it now, uh, the, I'm sure the plan would be that it would last for another 100 years. So when you look at it in the long term, you know, putting up with some inconvenience for two or three years uh, is not that inconvenient in the in a long term scheme of things. It's true, yeah. Um, someone else asks, why is the Logan Square platform so long? Do you know? Well, um, I am sure that it has to do with the fact that you have. Uh, you want to have entrances at different different places, uh, and and so the street grid layout would influence that. And as long as the uh, platform is long enough to accommodate uh, any conceivable train that they might run, it would be it would be long enough in theory. But but you also have to have entrances and exits, and and in many uh, highly used stations, you want to have um, two at one at each end. So the street grid layout, I'm sure, had something to do with the locations of, uh, of the entrances and exits there and uh, how long the platform is. Um, someone else asks, what do you think is the value of public transportation, especially as we are facing increasing environmental challenges and climate change? Should we be reversing some of what your book says and expanding our public transit options further? Yes, uh, I, I, I think it makes the city um, livable in the, in the way that we have uh, become accustomed to it. it the, the gridlock that you would have, if you, had no, if you had no L system or subways, the gridlock would just be so much worse and the air pollution and everything, um, it, it just makes uh, life in the city and the downtown uh, possible. The, the way that uh, that we've become accustomed to it, and uh, I think everything possible should be done to expand it. Um, but it's uh, we expect so much more now from our transit and our transit stations and the L cars and the kinds of stations that we want to have. I mean, when you build something now, it's not like you were building it in 1895. In, in, in some cases, then you would just lay some tracks in, on the ground and build a very simple um, platform and there's your station. But now you, you want it to be handicapped accessible. You, you uh, have an elevator, you, you have amenities, you have um, uh, like say the, the uptown station was rebuilt and that cost $250 million. But the station will be there probably for a hundred years. And so in, when you look at it that way, it's an investment. It's sort of like as a society, we ask ourselves, what is the value of, a, of, of all this to us? And I think in economic terms, you would say the value is quite great. And because the value is quite great, we give it this importance and we wanted to do achieve certain things. Uh, and so uh, the kinds of uh, requirements that you have now um, kind of dictate um, the expense and uh, the planning that goes into it. They've been planning the extension of the red line south of 95th Street for years and eventually it will be built and it will serve 
more people, but it isn't uh, done willy nilly kind of way that it was in the uh, 1890s. It's like, well, we'll just build this and we'll see what happens, you know? That's true. Uh, well, I think we have time for one more question and I saved this one for last because I like it a lot. Um, if you personally could wave a magic wand and bring back one of the lost elves in your book or change something else, what would you choose? So if you had a magic wand. <laughs> oh, uh, the Humboldt Park Branch. Um, if it could have been extended uh, running north of, yeah, I realized it ran just north of North Avenue, but the, the northwest side of the city had so very little service. Uh, why would you want to get rid of any of it? would be my um, point of view on that. They, um, they didn't have the money to extend it. And by the time the city really took over everything, the only way that they wanted to, to do anything was a subway. And of course that would have been very expensive um, uh, to build. And um, so that, that was, I think a missed opportunity. But of course, when you look at all the different uh, things that were, eliminated, you can find good logical reasons uh, for why all of them, all those decisions were made. It's hard to argue with the decisions that were made in 1952, when the resources were so much more limited and, and they just didn't know where all the money was going to come from and there was no, no federal aid for transit. Everything had to kind of sink or swim, you know, living out of the fare box. And so you know, if they, they didn't have the finances and the, and the resources to, uh, to keep some of these things going, they had to pick and choose. So it's, it's, it's kind of hard to fault the, the decision making that is involved in that now. That's great. Well, thank you so much, David. This has been really wonderful. Again, don't forget if you want to get a copy of the book, of course, you can check it out at the Chicago Public Library, but you want to visit David's blog for all kinds of other information. Uh, and tell us again the name of your blog. It is called The Trolley Dodger, and it is at thetrolleydodger.com. So if you just do a Google search on Trolley Dodger, I'm sure it'll come up. That's great. Well, that's all the time we have for today, but I want to thank David Sadowski for being here with us. Thanks to CPL Tech Leland Mosley for producing this event, and thanks to all of you for being here. Don't forget, please visit onebookonechicago.org for information about upcoming events around our theme, Neighborhoods, Our City's Bedrock including book discussions, films, author events, art programs, and more. Also visit the CPL YouTube and Facebook pages for on-demand video content, including from tonight's program. Have a great week, everyone.